Finally, I'm driving an Alfa Romeo. My tester today is an Alfa Giulia Veloce diesel all-wheel drive. And even though the diesel isn't really the best match for this sporty looking and sporty driving car, it's not a bad diesel and it's not a version to, um, to not recommend. This is my first ever contact with the Giulia, a car I've been fetishizing for, well, since it was launched in 2016, I think. And in my head, it had risen up on a pedestal and it was clearly better than all its rivals, especially for a keen driver such as myself. However, driving your hero, in this case the Giulia, you find uh, that your preconceived notion was wrong. It's not that the car isn't great, because it is, but I ended up liking it for different reasons to the ones that I was initially speculating. But first let me give you some background on this vehicle. This Alfa Romeo Giulia debuted in 2016 and it rides on a bespoke rear-wheel drive platform, Alfa's first since the 75 model of the mid-90s, early 90s actually. The Giulia rides on a very important platform for Alfa Romeo, or at least it was important for Alfa when Sergio Marchione was at the helm of the company. He had ambitions to turn Alfa Romeo into a real BMW beater. And I have to say, his contribution to the automotive world and Alfa Romeo's history is definitely a positive one, I think. I mean, Alfa Romeo isn't the kind of manufacturer that has, uh, let's say, a continuity in its lineup. Sometimes it launches front-wheel drive vehicles, sometimes it launches rear-wheel drive vehicles. And the reasons behind these decisions are usually um, money-related. So for the Giorgio platform that underpins this Giulia, as well as the Stelvio, Alfa Romeo invested huge sums of money, reportedly up to 5 billion euros, because they wanted to make this platform scalable so that they could, you know, stretch it or shorten it depending on its use. The reason why I'm talking about this platform is because now Alfa Romeo is under Stellantis, which is the company that was formed through the merger of PSA, Peugeot, Citroën and Fiat. And now that Alfa Romeo is part of Stellantis, the Giorgio platform will be discontinued. The new Alfa Romeo model that was just shown, the Tonale, that is not built on the Giorgio platform, and the now parent company Stellantis announced that all future Alphas would be underpinned by Stellantis group platforms, which are usually a Peugeot platforms. And I think that it's a real shame that that platform, Giorgio, will not be used and refined and improved over the years. I think its biggest problem, why they are discontinuing it, is because it was not really designed with electrification in mind. The former CEO of uh, Fiat Chrysler, Marchione, was not a big fan of electrification. He didn't really believe in it. And there is no better evidence for that than the Fiat 500e that um, they sold in the US only because they had to. And that vehicle, even though it was quite good, I've not driven one, but I'm very curious, and even though it was quite good, it showed that Fiat, the Fiat group, the company behind it, wasn't really trying. And the reason why I think this is bad is because this platform and this car are awesome. My tester is finished in stunning Misano blue. I think this color is just as good as any of the reds, if not better. It's such a head turner, this thing. In this spec, with the 19-inch telephone dial wheels and the optional yellow calipers, with what has to be the sexiest font I've ever seen in a car. You know, the Alfa Romeo script. It is art. It is beautiful. I don't think I've ever driven a car that made me um, want to look behind. In fact, I think I have looked at this car every single time I have locked it and walked away from it. For real. You just cannot help it. If you're an enthusiast and you like sporty sedans, this tickles you in a very, very special way and in a very, very special place. And this car also makes reviewing cars easier because I have a lot of things to say about it. I don't even have to think about it. The interior, I like a lot in this car, to be honest. I will begin with the steering wheel, which is what I'm holding on to now. It is not as thick as in BMWs, but it is still thick enough to feel sporty. It's probably one of the best steering wheels I have ever gripped onto, to be honest. I like that the, the center, the hub where the airbag is, it's further away from you than the rim, so the rim is closer to you. It's like in a racing car, you know, 
when the, the prongs of the, the wheel are like this and the wheel is here. It's not that extreme, it's not like that. It's more like, you know, that. But it's, um, it's great. It really, really helps the sportiness. Big, big kudos for the start-stop button on the steering wheel. A very Ferrari-esque touch. I like the fact that the logo is black and white. The paddles, do I need to talk about the paddles? They are solid aluminum, they are cold to the touch. They are very sturdy, they don't move around. Most places you touch in the Alfa Giulia are very pleasant. The top of the doors is nice, the top of the dash is nice. This part where your knee might hit the, the center console is also padded. And while I don't like the pig skin texture, which I think this is trying to imitate, it's supposed to look like leather even though I'm pretty sure it isn't. Maybe I'm wrong, could be leather, but I'm not sure. Either way, this is very old school, and for me, it's, it detracts from the look of the interior, I have to say, which is a shame because the design is one of the best in class, especially how they integrated the infotainment screen, the 8.8-inch infotainment screen. It was um, replaced with this one like two years ago, I think, and. That's when the vehicle also got um, Apple CarPlay and Android Auto. And even though it's quite good, it's now both a touchscreen and you can control it through this uh, physical control here. It was not a touchscreen before. The screen itself, while it looks good, it doesn't look the best and it doesn't react the best. And the menu structure, I've still not gotten used to it. It may be that I'm not used to Alfa Romeos, generally speaking, but this infotainment, it's taking me a bit longer to um, get accustomed to than uh, others. Although again, this might just be my lack of experience with vehicles from this uh, manufacturer. I do appreciate that it has physical climate control. I do like the, uh, the texture of the material here. It feels like some sort of carbon, although it's not carbon fiber, but it's like a weave type material similar to carbon fiber. And it's not glossy black plastic, which is awesome. I like the rotary control for the volume here to the, to the right of the infotainment controls. To the left of that you have the DNA switch which moves the vehicle from dynamic into normal and then automatic, all the weather. Can't remember what that's called. But it's the efficient mode. I just keep it in dynamic and uh, slacken the suspension. I really like this. It makes me feel like I'm in a Ferrari. A diesel Ferrari? but a Ferrari nonetheless. <laughs> and frankly, this is how I drove this vehicle throughout my uh, time with it, in dynamic mode with the suspension slack. And, and I really like that the vehicle actually um, remembers your settings. So when you stop it and start it again, if you left it in D, it's gonna be in D. Can't remember which other car did that. I know the Honda Civic Type R starts in um, in sport mode and then you have to crank it down to normal or plus r if you want the extreme mode but i'm not sure which other car did that i like the the squishy armrest i like the look of the gear selector even though its functionality is a bit strange sometimes when you put it when you want to move it from drive into reverse it just goes into neutral and you have to push it again sometimes it works sometimes it doesn't you can pull on both paddles at the same time to put the car in neutral and then you just pull it forward once and it uh, goes into reverse. Overall, the interior I think is, uh, is great aside from the, the fake leather texture, which I'm not a big fan of, especially since it's quite obvious. I mean, whenever I look in that general direction, uh, that's the first thing I see. Then I see the swoopy dash and uh, spory general design. And speaking of sporty general design, I have to mention the seats. The sport seats fitted to this vehicle have amazingly big uh, side supports and they really, really keep you firmly in place even when you drive this car very spiritedly. Space in the rear is actually pretty good. I do fit behind myself and I don't actually touch the, the headliner you can get the six-way adjustable electric sports driver's seat really, really low and you get a very race car-like driving position. It is similarly good to what I experienced in the BMW 3 Series. 
as well as the Kia Stinger, which was a surprise to me in terms of how good its driving position was. It was up there with the best. And this is also up there with the best. And aside from looking sporty and making you feel special and making you want to wax poetic about uh, its lines and its curves and uh, its feeling and, you know, all of that. My tester has a heated steering wheel and heated seats, dual zone climate control, pretty standard stuff, automatic headlights. Oh yeah, and the trunk. Even though it's um, not the easiest to load stuff into because the opening is not the biggest and it's not particularly square, which is what you want in a trunk opening, it's actually one of the roomiest in the class at 480 liters. But even so, for carrying four people because the very, very tall transmission tunnel in the middle of the, of the vehicle really makes the middle rear seat quite uncomfortable. You, there's really nowhere to put your feet but other than that it is surprisingly practical and the vehicle also has all the pretty much all the tech features you would expect aside from uh, I'm guessing automatic high beams you get a wireless phone charger here which is quite conveniently placed although you don't see anything that's happening on your phone but it's very convenient because you get used to its location and then when your arm is uh, resting on the the center armrest you can just yank it out. Inside the armrest you get um, one USB and one USB-C and then you get another USB here next to a 12 volt cigarette lighter in front of the cup holders and you get quite a deep space here for your keys and whatever and I think there's a rubber mat on the bottom, yes there is, so your stuff is not going to rattle around. You also get a place where you can keep the key and see the pretty Alfa Romeo script on it or the pretty Alfa Romeo logo on it. My tester has a keyless entry and keyless go so you don't have to, uh, you know, use the key at all which is a shame because it is a nice feeling, nice looking key although it is a bit thick so it might uh, give you bulging pockets which is not bad. It's nice to have bulging pockets. You can afford the, the quadrifolio version of this. Let me tell you about the engine that's in this car. It's a 2.2 liter turbocharged. It is Euro 6D compliant. It makes 210 horsepower and 470 newton meters on overboost. Initially searching for this car's specs, all websites listed the maximum torque as being 470, but it's actually 450. And I found the information on the Alfa Romeo official website brochure configurator thing. So I assume the extra 20 newton meters is overboost, which is temporary extra torque when you floor the gas. With all-wheel drive, Alpha says that this vehicle will sprint to 100 kilometers per hour in 6.8 seconds, and it will top out at around 230 kilometers per hour. And in my all-wheel drive tester, it actually has a um, kind of transfer case thing in the middle and power is sent to that from the wheel and then there's a prop shaft that sends the power back to the front axle. Although the way this all-wheel drive system is set up, if the car does not sense any loss of grip or traction, all power goes to the rear wheels. And what's interesting is that this car, any version you pick, actually has a carbon fiber prop shaft made by Hitachi in Japan, which is around 40% lighter than a comparable metal one. So it's cool that even in the base diesel Julia, you, you get that technology, that lightweight technology that is. The engine itself is not the most refined or the most responsive, but it's uh, not a bad unit. It actually sounds fairly sporty for a diesel if you listen to it from the outside. The exhaust note is, um, it's okay. It's only at idle when it sounds a bit gruff, especially after a cold start. It really sounds very um, metallic and tappity, I think is the word. But as it warms up, it does get more refined. What never fades though is the um, slight lag when you accelerate, especially in, um, in comfort mode, in, in normal, in the end mode. For instance, now I'm doing 50 kilometers per hour and if I floor it, now it picks up. If I put it in dynamic mode, let me just slacken the suspension, it will hold on to a higher gear and pickup is more immediate, but it's not perfect. It still uh, isn't the best response from such a diesel engine, at least from the ones that I've driven. And I think I have um, 
quite a bit of experience because I've not only driven many, many sports sedans with a diesel engine, because press fleets are filled with them, because that's the model people actually buy, the two liter diesel with the all-wheel drive box ticked. And I also drive a three series, an E90 facelift 320D with the N47 engine. And while my car is like 50 horsepower down on this, I don't think the performance difference is that uh, significant. My car is a few pounds lighter, almost 100 kilos, I think. This, in this configuration, with the heavy diesel up front and all-wheel drive, it's over 1,600 kilograms. And even though you don't feel it, you genuinely don't feel it, this chassis is amazing, but we'll get to that soon. You do feel it when it comes to the acceleration. I mean, 210 horsepower, you only really feel them when you're really, really on it and when you're using the, um, the wonderful paddles to shift gears and keep it in the power band. But I like the engine. It's a characterful for a four-cylinder diesel. And if you take control of the gearbox yourself, the eight-speed ZF gearbox that is in many other vehicles, but as you would expect in this car, it has special Alfa Romeo tuning to make it feel unique. And I can tell you that it's really responsive. Let me just stiffen the suspension. <laughs> okay, roll is almost instantly eliminated. I like that this gearbox in this car really, really wants to downshift, even when you're at higher RPMs. Something which it doesn't really do as well, I think, in other applications with different software controlling it. I must also praise this vehicle for its very high comfort levels. Being a car designed in Italy, mainly for Italians, although it is an internationally minded project, and I like that it has the bumpy road mode that you know from Ferraris, and also the Maserati had a separate button to slacken the suspension. I really, really like this approach, and I think the Germans are doing it wrong. Although the Italians are also doing it wrong because you don't have an individual mode where you can, you know, pair uh, the hard steering, you know, the sporty steering with the soft suspension, but the strong engine response, and maybe you want the gearbox slackened, or whatever your preference may be. And for a vehicle that rides on 19-inch wheels with not very much uh, tire, it's actually remarkably comfortable. We in Romania have quite bad roads, so this is welcome. There are more comfortable options, like the Mercedes C-Class, obviously, at least from the ones that I've driven. And there are also more extreme options in the class, the Jaguar XC, which I've driven, and I think it drives better than this if you really, really want to drive it in a sporty fashion but it is nowhere near as comfortable or as accomplished all around as this. You kind of drive that um, in a more brutal way, you know, you throw it into corners, you feel for the grip, but in this you drive it um, in a more elegant fashion, even when you drive it quickly, because the car just, I don't know, it flows, for lack of a better uh, word. Okay, so let's see what zero to 100 kilometers per hour in 6.8 seconds looks and feels like in this alpha. Trying to shift up at 4,500 RPM. I really like the jolt in the back that you get from the gearbox. It's quick. Nobody should complain about this car's performance. It is adequate. Gearbox is great, as I said. Really likes to shift down. It will even give you a second. And it revved to like 4,000 there. It's a fantastic driving package. Really, really, really enjoyable thing to drive, even as a diesel. I will say one thing I do not agree with is Alpha's choice not to offer a button or any means to disable traction control and ESP. It's not something you do every day, but on the odd, snowy, empty mountain road that you would find yourself on, it would be a shame not to just slide it around a little bit, you know? 
when you know it's safe and you are not endangering anyone or yourself. Or again, in winter, when you get stuck and you want to rock the car back and forth. I've been reading uh, the Alpha Julia forums, owners forum from Canada, and people are complaining about this because Canada has quite cold weather and uh, harsh winters and a lot of snow in places. And I see people have mixed opinions about this. Some say that they don't need uh, the nannies disabled and that the vehicle understands that it is stuck and it allows the wheels to spin freely and it gets itself unstuck that way. I've not been able to test it because, as you can see, even though it's uh, late winter, it's still bone dry out. We had hardly any snow this winter. It's probably one of the most snowless winters that I can recall. Um, let's see what the fuel consumption is because when you buy a diesel, how much fuel it uses is important. Where the heck is it? Efficient drive consumption history. So let's see. So on this graph, it shows that I've been averaging around 5 liters per 100 kilometers a day on the uh, extra urban cycle, I guess. So I drove this car to the twisty road, twisty-ish road that I am on now, on the highway, and it never crept above uh, 5. It was actually lower than 5. It was like 4-ish. From what I've seen, you can expect it to use around 7.5 to 8 on the combined cycle. I think the official claim is around 5 liters or under 5 liters even for the all-wheel drive car that I'm driving today. Matching this car's sporty driving dynamics is its sporty exterior. This car, I think, it is the prettiest in its class and probably the prettiest sports sedan currently available. Although I did have a ponchon for the Cadillac ATS which I never got to drive. I don't think I've ever seen one in real life. But that car intrigues me very, very much. I really, really want to try one out. So if you live in Romania and have a Cadillac ATS and you want to let me drive it, let me drive it. I'll drive it. So I really like that. But aside from that, um, at least from the vehicles you can buy here in Romania and in Europe, the Giulia is um, the prettiest. In the Misano Blue that I'm driving it in today, it's probably the most head-turning vehicle I've driven in a long, long time. It is helped by the stunning, gorgeous, optional wheels, the 19s, the staggered wheels. They are 255s on the rear, and I can't remember the, the front width. I'll put it up on screen. And they are shod in Pirelli Sotto Zero tires, something, can't remember what they're called. So they're winter tires, but they are sporty winter tires. Boy, this car grips so, so freaking well. And it does like to rev up to 4500 even though peak power is actually delivered quite a bit below 4000. I think it's at uh, 3700 RPM. And even on downshifts, I can't say how impressed I am by this. And even if I want first. It will give me first. It's so nice. So anyway, the, um, the exterior. My uh, Veloce tester has special front and rear bumpers, which I think completely transform the look of this vehicle. They really... Um, make it look like a proper sports sedan. The standard car is fine, although if you get it with the standard halogen headlights, it's um, not amazing, to be honest. Oh yeah, and this vehicle in 2022 can only be had with either halogens or xenon lights, which is a bit weird. I mean, you know, there are much, much cheaper cars with uh, more sophisticated headlights these days. I mean, this is a few steps removed from uh, LED matrix type uh, headlights that have, you know, individual beams that they block to um, not dazzle oncoming cars while still allowing you to see further ahead of you at night. The headlights themselves are fine. I have Xenons on my BMW, my 10-year-old, 11-year-old now BMW, and 
they are very good. I really like that this vehicle, unlike most of its rivals that are, um, how do I put it, not as evocative looking as uh, the Giulia. The same can be said of the, um, the Maserati Ghibli, because that is also a very um, voluptuous and shapely car. And this car just looks like it, um, it went to the gym and um, it got really, really well-defined muscles. It is such a special looking thing. The way the body is designed, it highlights the, the wheels. It's, it's fantastic. The only area where it is lacking in the handling department is when it comes to the, the brakes. So it has a by-wire braking system, which is not bad. I would not have noticed if I did not read about it. I would only have noticed that, um, well, there's a bit of inconsistency to how much pressure you need to apply to the pedal. This is less apparent at higher speeds, but in town, when you want to get the vehicle to stop in uh, slowly rolling stop-start traffic, so you press the brake a little bit and the vehicle seems like it it won't stop when you want it to stop. And then you press the brake more and it comes to a halt uh, quicker than you would have liked. This is a minor niggle. And it is another example of why I say that this platform had amazing potential, but it was never actually exploited completely, I think. Although maybe if I drive the, the Quadrifoglio version, I might uh, have a different opinion about that. But the brakes themselves are very, very competent. Let's see. It's just that you feel a bit detached from them, let's say. My conclusion about the Alfa Giulia Veloce diesel all-wheel drive is that it will break for you if somebody slams on their brakes in front of you. Because if it has, of course, all the um, active safety aids that you would expect to see in such a vehicle. Before driving this car, I had a feeling I was going to rank it very highly on my list of cars I would like to buy for myself that I would enjoy and that would make me happy. And after driving it and experiencing it for a while, I can confirm that that is true. This is as good to drive as you think it's going to be, maybe even better. Even if you have experience driving sports sedans, you will still like this and think that it is uh, better than most you've previously driven. At least when it comes to these uh, very modern uh, and more uh, clinical cars. They just detach you from the experience of driving. But the Alpha does a great job in um, still telling you what's going on and keeping things fun. Even as a diesel.